Valles Marineris is the largest canyon in the solar system. It is about 4,000 kilometers across. That is similar to the length of mainland United States. There is not a single canyon on Earth even close to the size of Valles Marineris. To understand the history of this giant canyon, first we are going to take a look at its impressive features and then gradually start taking a look at what happened throughout its long history. This close to real color image of this canyon was taken by the Viking orbiters which were around Mars in the 70s. But taking a look at Mars through a topographic map, we can see that not only is this canyon enormous, it is also extremely deep. The red elevated plateau that can be seen here is generally about 4.5 kilometers above Mars's zero meter reference point, while the blue floor of the canyon is about 5 kilometers below Mars's zero meter point. So yes, this means that this canyon has walls that are about 9.5 kilometers tall. And yes, under conditions with low atmospheric dust, nearly the entirety of the wall would be visible from the surface. In this colorized image, we can see that the walls aren't exactly vertical, but they are still rather steep. There is pretty much no place on Earth that rivals the visible height of these walls. A good chunk of the height of Mount Everest simply cannot be seen while standing from any place on the surface. And Mauna Kea, which is about 10 kilometers from top to bottom, is well mostly underwater. So then when and how did this giant canyon form? Currently the leading theory is that first this extremely elevated Tharsis Plateau formed. The main formational stage happened in the Noachian and was probably fully formed during the late Noachian, so fully formed about 3.7 billion years ago. During the Noachian, lava started pouring in this region, leading to an extreme buildup of volcanic materials. Eventually, the primary volcanic source moved away, and the buildup of volcanic materials started being very uneven. The topographic map clearly shows an uneven buildup throughout different vast regions. This intense, uneven buildup eventually led to the supporting crust that is beneath volcanic materials to flex, and that then produced the first fractures that eventually widened and became the canyon that we see today. We can see how the cracking starts to expand from the most elevated region down to the less elevated one. The crack really starts to expand from the western part of Noctis Labyrinthus to the eastern one. And that name is very much appropriate for this region. There are countless interconnected valleys going in many different directions and the valleys are surrounded by 3 kilometer tall walls. Zooming in a bit into this region is switching to a close to real color image of the surface, we can see just how relatively well preserved the upland parts are. Here is an even greater close up of the valleys of Noctis. We can see how compared to the well preserved surface of the upland parts, the floor of the valleys is much more chaotic which is likely a result of landslides. We can see dense sliding patterns from top to bottom. Here is what an on the ground view of the floor of the valleys looks like. However, a real sense of scale of just how enormous these walls are cannot easily be comprehended through a screen. Noctis Labyrinthus likely formed in the late Hesperian, so somewhere around 3 billion years ago. That is concluded through crater counting. So obviously it formed after the Tharsis Plateau, which was mostly there by around 3.7 billion years ago. But Tharsis still likely had active material accumulation probably after that. The likely mechanism behind the formation of Noctis is, as already mentioned, first a flexing of the crust due to too much load, the flexing then caused the Tharsis Plateau to crack, then the subsurface cracks filled with magma. Eventually the subsurface cracks, the chambers got emptied and the surface above collapsed. That then formed this maze-like network of valleys that we see today. This formational process happened about 3 billion years ago, the time during which there was still some liquid water on Mars and there is some pretty good evidence of lakes at one of the valley dead ends. On the floor, a 2012 study found deposits of materials that mostly form in the presence of water. Those deposits are hydrated minerals. Some of the hydrated minerals found in the region include clays, sulfates, opaline silica and others. This place has a very exceptional variety of minerals. The conclusion with regards to this great variety of minerals was derived from the spectrometer instruments attached to the various Mars orbiters. Basically, all of those minerals detected have specific wavelengths. An image shows that area overlaid with colors that represent different sites. The blue areas are where the layered deposits were found. These aren't very large, approximately 10 kilometers across each. A better, closer, real color image of these two sites reveals that they are slight depressions. Because these were dated back to the late Hesperian, 
This also means that these pools were present on Mars during a time where bodies of liquid water were on a significant decline. The minerals found in these two small lakes were also likely a result of hydrothermal activity, because that's how the minerals found there typically form. So given the warmth and the variety of minerals, this suggests that there was a pretty good environment for life to exist. So it is definitely a promising site for future exploration with rovers. Here is another site in Noctis, also showing a very similar pool-like area that has hydrated minerals that was also likely a mini lake. One study identified 10 light tone deposits in the valleys of Noctis Labyrinthus that contained hydrated minerals. Overall, the conclusion is that all of them do somewhat differ in terms of composition. This suggests that there was more than just one process and water level that altered these regions. The age of the sites found appears to potentially extend into the Amazonian, the time period that Mars is currently in. However, it is probably the early Amazonian that water was present in the valleys of Noctis. Potentially, at times, water flowed through the valleys. How the water got to be in Noctis isn't all that clear. However, groundwater infiltration appears to be likely. Possibly snow melting also played a role to a degree. On the edge between the rest of Valles Marineris and Noctis Labyrinthus, there is a relatively recently discovered volcano. It was discovered in 2024. From this angle, it is really hard to spot, but turning the image around and pointing at the central caldera, we can start to see what is going on here. At one point, this was an active volcano. This right here is a typical caldera and not an impact crater, although they do look somewhat similar. This caldera has a rather flat floor without a central peak and smooth edges. These form when the magma chamber below the surface gets emptied and the surface above as a result of the emptying collapses. The upland parts surrounding the caldera have a maximum height of about 9 kilometers above Mars's zero meter point. And the further the upland parts are from the central caldera, the less elevated they are. There is a gradual drop off in height. So it's obvious that this is a volcano with these facts in mind. However, without these clues, it is not so obvious because this volcano blends in with the rest of Noctis because the cracking that created Noctis also spread to this volcano, shattering it into different elevated top parts. This also points towards the idea that the Noctis volcano is older than Valles Marineris and Noctis Labyrinthus. The inner diameter of this volcano is 250 kilometers. This is the part that has most of the eroded high elevation uplands. However, when counting the outer part of the volcano with less elevated parts, this volcano was likely about 450 kilometers across. So although the Noctis volcano isn't as tall, it is about as large in terms of surface area as the three volcanoes that are directly on the Tharsis Plateau. It also probably formed during a similar time, so around the time that the Tharsis Plateau started forming. Right next to Noctis, there is this area filled with some very intriguing terrain. A zoomed-in view reveals these rootless cones. Next to them are volcanic deposits. One idea is that these cones formed as a result of hot volcanic material coming into contact with water, which then produced these steam vents. The light tone deposits visible here were detected to have sulfate salts. These salts form as a result of volcanic materials coming into contact with water. Very easily, there could still be a bunch of water ice hidden beneath these salts. So yes, this is potentially one of the lowest latitude glaciers on Mars. Valles Marineris is almost right at the equator. Here is a pit in the region of the Noctis volcano close to the steam vents. This image shows light tone deposits with hydrogen minerals at the walls. Also, here is one image showing the light tone deposits located at the floor of one of the valleys that intersects with the Noctis volcano. Considering that these regions have hydrated minerals, water was likely present in this region. Hydrated minerals were detected in every single named chasma of Valles Marineris. That is to say, every deep elongated named depression of Marineris has pretty clear evidence that it had liquid water in the past, and with that lakes around 3 billion years ago. But because these were lakes, it does also appear to be the case that Marineris wasn't fully flooded and connected with the large ocean in the North Polar Basin. And if Marineris was connected, then it almost certainly wasn't for a significant amount of time, as that would leave certain geological evidence behind, such as the evidence of a shoreline at a high elevation at the walls. On top of that, it's hard to say if the ocean and liquid water in Marineris were present during the same time, so there is potentially a timeline mismatch. 
groundwater intruding into Marineris looks like the most likely explanation as to how the lakes formed. Taking a look at the floor of Marineris through a topographic map reveals large and tall bumps that would prevent water from forming a uniform, that is, interconnected lake spread across the entirety of the floor of this canyon. Only with a water level above about 3 kilometers would that be possible. And it appears that there wasn't a water level that high, at least not for long. Still, despite that, there is evidence for one giant lake. The largest body of interconnected water in Marineris was likely located in Copertes Chasma, which is this part of the canyon where the walls of Marineris are the tallest. The floor here is relatively flat, that is, flat compared to other parts of the canyon. This is very good for ponding. One study found the evidence of a water level present at a maximum elevation of minus 3.5 kilometers, meaning the lake here had a maximum depth of about 1.5 kilometers and the average ponding depth was 842 meters. Considering the evidence for the maximum water level, this image was created showing the immense size that this lake once had. It had a surface area of about 110,000 kilometers square. In considering the water level, it had a water volume of about 110,000 kilometers cubic. So a water volume similar to the Great Lakes, the largest freshwater lakes on Earth, combined with the water volume of the Caspian Sea which is also actually a lake, but has salt water. The conclusion with regards to what the water level was like was done through the detection of benches and their elevation. Benches are these step-like terraces found on the walls of Copertes and Melas, the two parts of Valles Marineris. This image shows what the benches look like. B in the image shows exactly where they are. These benches form essentially through water erosion. Because all of the identified benches didn't go above about minus 3.5 kilometers, that is what allowed for the conclusion as to what the likely maximum water level of the lake was. However, the benches shown here are type 1. Figure 8 on the left shows type 1 benches, which were found at a higher elevation, and figure 9 on the right shows type 2 benches, which were found at lower elevations. The fact that bench type 1 and type 2 have differing elevations that are consistent tells us that the lake in Copertes likely had two relatively long and somewhat stable periods with two different water levels. That stability of the water level then led to the erosion of the walls and ultimately to the formation of the two bench types that we are seeing today. The water level in Copertes was at one point sufficient to start spilling over. This intense breach of water caused a very energetic flood. This image which gives us the view of the entirety of the lake at its maximum water level shows the water spilling over from Copertes into the region called Eos. The image below here gives us a topographic view of the region in Eos where the water was flooding. The image at the top shows what that region really looks like in black and white. The rectangles are highlighting the very clear flow features. These images show an even more zoomed in view and the flow patterns become even more obvious here. The scale bars in each image represents 5 kilometers. So, although these are pretty zoomed in, the scale bars indicate that these are still massive and intense flow features. This image shows the wrinkle ridges that were observed in Copertes Chasma and Capri Chasma floors. Capri is connected to Copertes. Now, there are plenty of other wrinkle ridges on Mars, and the ones that were formed by a volcanic process are usually spaced by a few tens of kilometers. Meanwhile, the wrinkle ridges observed in Copertes and Capri are spaced by a few kilometers. The proposed mechanism for formation here is that a volatile rich floor deposit, that is water ice, dried out, and that then caused for the floor to contract and sink, which then formed the somewhat polygonal wrinkle ridge pattern. While at the topic of Copertes, the seasonal flows observed here are worth mentioning. So during the warm seasons on some steep slopes, these dark narrow lines appear. They grow during the warm seasons and then disappear during cold seasons. These seasonal flows were also observed outside of Copertes, such as here in a crater far away from Marineris. One idea as to what is observed with these lines is extremely salty water being warmed up during the warm seasons such that it turns liquid, which then causes it to slide down and create the dark streaks. Specifically, extremely salty water is suggested because extremely salty water could maybe turn liquid at Mars's cold temperatures, as very salty water can be a liquid well below zero degrees Celsius. However, it appears that no water was detected at those sites, at least not directly. And on top of that, the lines stopped at an angle of about 28 degrees, which is consistent with a dry sand flow, a sort of mini avalanche. 
so although a dry avalanche isn't all that exciting, as it isn't evidence of water, on top of benches and flow patterns, hydrogen minerals were also detected in Copertes. So the overall evidence for the existence of a lake in the past in Copertes is still pretty strong. Hydrogen minerals were also detected in Kander Chasma. This dead-end valley also had a pretty large surface area covered with water, as indicated by this image, which also showed us the extent of the lake in Copertes. This is an image from Kander showing layered sedimentary rocks. The light parts are where the hydrogen minerals are located. So liquid water heavily altered the surface of Kander. On top of that, European Space Agency's Trace Gas Orbiter detected a bunch of water in Kander. This map shows that the intensity of water detected is much greater in Kander compared to other Chasma of Valles Marineris. However, this detection of water could be ice, but it also could be water that is chemically bound to minerals in the region, so the type of water present here is unclear. This map was created using the fine resolution epithermal neutron detector instrument on the Trace Gas Orbiter. Neutrons are created on Mars when the cosmic rays strike its surface. Depending on the amount of neutrons detected, the hydrogen content and with that water content of a region is revealed. So the evidence for many isolated lakes present throughout Valles Marineris around 3 billion years ago is pretty clear. However, as of now this location wasn't explored with any rovers or landers. It was at one point a candidate landing site for NASA's Mars Science Laboratory rover, which is today known as the Curiosity rover, which is currently in the crater called Gale, which is far away from Valles Marineris. Still, considering how promising this giant canyon is for detecting some evidence for life, it could easily be the landing site of some other future rover.